From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lyons. Dueling speeches today on the border by President Biden and Donald Trump with immigration a defining issue in the presidential campaign. We'll discuss with Republican Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis. And the House passes another stopgap funding measure to avoid a partial government shutdown. But the Senate still needs to sign off. We'll speak with Democratic Majority Whip, Senator Dick Durbin. And a large majority of swing state voters think President Biden is too old. According to our new Bloomberg News Morning Consult poll, they think Donald Trump is too dangerous. We'll dig in on what else we learned. Kaylee, we've got a lot to talk about, including our Bloomberg News poll today that feeds directly into this campaign cycle and one that brings us to the border. We're going to talk about that in a moment here, but we do have some news. The House passed a CR, Indeed. and it's looking less likely that we have a government shutdown. Tomorrow. Yeah, it's not a done deal yet, as the Senate still needs to sign it off and get it to President Biden's desk, keeping mm -hmm. in mind that President Biden is not in the Oval Office at the moment because he was literally just speaking moments ago at the border in Texas. Folks, it's time for us to move on this. We can't wait any longer. Folks, on my first day as president, I introduced a bill I sent to Congress, a comprehensive plan to fix the broken immigration system and to secure the border. But no action was taken. That's where we start now with Bloomberg's Julie Fine, joined as well by Michael Shepard and Wendy Benjaminson. Julie, you're joining us from Texas, where both Joe Biden and Donald Trump are today. Two different stops on the border, about 300 miles apart. Am I right that neither of them made news? Well, neither of them really did anything you would have not have expected them to do. For instance, you knew that President Biden was going to go there and try to flip the script. He hasn't been to that part of the border. He went to El Paso last year, but he has not been to Brownsville. So he goes there and basically says, hey, we tried to get a bill passed. The Republicans made sure it didn't get to the floor. So now what he's trying to do is put the pressure on the Republicans. Republicans have been pressuring throughout this campaign about getting something passed when it comes to immigration. So now he's saying, OK, we did it. It's your move. As for the former president, Joe, as you know, he's visited the uh, he has visited the border many times, basically saying the same thing. He will be tougher on immigration, blaming President Biden for everything that's happening there now. So nothing unexpected really came out of today. Well, how is it likely to be received by the Border Patrol agents that are standing there with the president, by others in Texas, that President Biden just says, look, I did my part in agreeing to this deal. It's up to Congress. I'm not even going to try to do anything else. There was no executive action or any other policy change announced today. Well, listen, Texas is a red state. So in terms of Texas, I don't think anything President Biden said today is really going to make a difference in how people vote here. In terms of nationally, I think that there are some Democrats that have said he has to do more on the border. And going there today, at least, is him saying, I am paying attention to this, saying it openly, and saying, I want to do something about this. However, for the people that think he has not done enough on immigration and have been supporting President Trump or other Republicans all along, I don't believe him going today flips the script on that. Just give us a, a sense of the geography we're talking about here quickly while you're with us, Julie. Donald Trump at Eagle Pass, we hear a lot about that. I think the way you termed that earlier is that's where the standoff is happening. How about Brownsville, where Joe Biden is today? We're looking at live pictures of him now. Okay, so Brownsville is at the more southern part of the state. Eagle Pass much more in the center, as you said, more than 300 miles apart. Eagle Pass is really the standoff. That is where the federal government and the Texas Department of Public Safety have really come to a standoff mm -hmm. in Eagle Pass there. When you look at Brownsville, Brownsville is a spot where there has been a lot of immigration and migrant issues in the past. Right now, living in Texas, you know there are certain hot spots for where there are a lot of people crossing the border. That is Eagle Pass right now. That is not Brownsville. All right, Julie Fine reporting for us live from Texas. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, here in Washington, House Speaker Mike Johnson spoke to reporters earlier today tying the border to government funding. 
the obvious truth is that we have to take care of America's needs first. We have to. The border is the issue to every American, no matter where they live, no matter where their state is, because every state's a border state. If we're going to take care of America's needs first, that means two things. It means securing the border. I would repeat it ten times for emphasis, but you understand what we're saying here. We have to secure the border. We have to do it. And we've got to fund our government. And so this week, we're, we're working very hard to do both of those things. So on that note, let's bring in Bloomberg's Michael Shepard. So, Michael, they tried to do one of those things today. The House did do their part, passing another continuing resolution, the fourth of this fiscal year. We assume that it is also going to pass the Senate. What is our degree of confidence that this is going to be the last stopgap measure we see out of this Congress? If you're asking me whether I have a <laughs> high degree of confidence in this being the fourth and final <laughs> continuing or interim spending resolution, uh, I don't place bets Not on that. that bet. I will say that um, they really would like to get this done. They realize that the more they kick the can down the road on spending, the more complicated it gets. We're in an election year. They have other issues that they need to get to. And they realize that the longer this drags out, the more of a pox on both houses, honestly. And Republicans, especially under Mike Johnson, have really been struggling to get their act together. When he took over as speaker from Kevin McCarthy uh, back in October, and you remember what a fraught experience that leadership fight was, um, he promised a well-oiled machine. And so far, we haven't really seen much evidence of that that, as you just described, all these battles over spending, what they're uh, stuck on right now is, one, they would like to see more spending cuts. Mm -hmm. They have re a reached agreement on the top line, but now they have to get down to the individual spending bills, and they just need more time to get through them. In part, immigration is one of the big issues. In part, another one is Ukraine funding. Right. Not tied to this, a separate matter, but it all gets thrown in together. What makes us think that two more weeks makes a difference if we've not been able to figure this out for almost half of the fiscal year? Uh, I realize they might get these first six done, but when this comes time to start debating Pentagon funding, Homeland Security, the DOJ... What's going to happen? Well, you're asking a, a very rational question. How are they using <laughs> their time? And especially when, you know, Congress is, is prone to leaving town uh -huh. and, you know, taking it, the House just returned on Wednesday from a nearly two week break. And you would think that they could use this time to actually work very intensively to yeah. try to set up and tee up those bills to get it done on time. But the politics up there are very messy and very divisive. And it may not augur well for, you know, the next spending deadline that we'll see for those bigger agencies come uh, later in March. Well, if they get it done tonight, lawmakers, after a two-week recess, will have a 24-hour work week to show for themselves. Michael Shepard, thank you. As we turn out of the new Bloomberg News Morning Consult swing state poll, it's just out today, and it shows a majority of swing state voters think President Biden is too old. The same poll also finds a majority of voters in those same swing states that will likely decide the election think Donald Trump is too dangerous. Bloomberg senior editor Wendy Benjaminson is here now with that. I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> Good question again. I'm not sure either. And the really interesting thing about the citing that Trump is too dangerous. Yeah. So 59 percent of our swing state voters said Trump is dangerous. But more than a quarter of those are going to vote for him anyway. <laughs> so who knows, maybe dangerous is not a bad thing in their mind mm -hmm. for a U.S. president, mm -hmm. maybe. They also, the same people found that he was a strong leader, um, you know, that they trusted him on things like that. Whereas Biden, when we asked about character traits, President Biden got more people saying he was compassionate, cares about people like me. Mm -hmm. The really interesting thing, which shows the effectiveness of Republican messaging, is that um, voters are evenly split on whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump is honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which is sort of interesting. On, more on the Donald Trump being dangerous is that there were open-ended questions where the respondents were allowed to volunteer what they had seen, read, or heard about either of the candidates. And the people who cited him as dangerous, when given the chance, offered up his comments that he would let Putin do whatever he wanted if NATO countries didn't pay their bills um, to NATO, and that... Um, uh, and cited the 91 felony counts against him. So that's where voters are seeing danger yeah. in Donald Trump. Okay, so that's all the adjectives. Dangerous, yeah. old, right. honest, <laughs> take a, your pick. On moment. the issues, though, we just saw both of these men making trips to the border mm -hmm. today. Right. Is that what, what's going to make a difference 
in these swing states? What it, do we find on the issues like immigration? It very well could. I mean, only one of our state's swing states is actually on the border, is right, Arizona. Arizona. The others go as far north as Michigan and Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. The, but the two issues that voters cite the most are the economy and immigration. As the economy begins to improve, though, you see that um, voters' concerns about the economy are going down while immigration keeps ticking up. It was up another three percentage points from just last month um, to this month as the number one issue for voters. So Donald Trump and Joe Biden, their staffs read those polls. They send them to the border to try to do something about it. Well, what will be done? Entirely separate question. Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson, thank you so much, as always. Now, coming up on the program, Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, the majority whip, will be with us as the House sends its continuing resolution to the Senate. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. It's the Senate's turn now to vote on a continuing resolution that would keep the government open for yet another week. We are kicking the can down the road once again, assuming that this measure passes. So let's go now to the Senate's majority whip. Illinois Democratic Senator Dick Durbin is with us now. Senator, thank you very much for your time. When is this vote happening, and are you confident the votes will be there to get this to the president's desk? I have confidence that we're going to pass this continuing resolution and at least by another week, maybe longer, to finish the appropriation process. I think it's going to be done this evening in the United States Senate. But before we have any ticker tape parades for Congress, let's remember we're in the fifth month of the fiscal year, fifth month out of 12. We still don't have the appropriation bills passed that we should. I want to salute Patty Murray, the Democrat from Washington, and Susan Collins, Republican from Maine in the Senate. They've been working on this for months. They've done a great job. I just hope the House can catch up with us. Well, I, I appreciate the reality check uh, here, Senator, because a lot of work has yet to be done. I realize there are top-line agreements here, but the real work remains, and I wonder if you think there might be a need for another. Is this the last CR that we're going to see this fiscal year? Far be it for me to predict the last CR. Uh, I've been around here a few years, and I've never seen one quite like this. What's happened over in the House of Representatives is unprecedented. 15 ballots for one speaker who is then removed, another speaker who emerges after days of mystery negotiations. I don't know Mike Johnson. I wish him the very best as Speaker of the House of Representatives. I think he's doing the right thing, buying a week or two to finish this off. But let's get it done. Well, Senator, do you also think he's doing the right thing, not putting the aid package passed by the Senate on the floor of the House that would provide funding to allies like Ukraine? and Israel, or is this going to require a discharge petition? Well, I I can tell you the discharge petition is a theory that very seldom happens. Uh, I hope that people come to their senses. If this measure, this bipartisan measure that we passed in the Senate to deal with the defense supplemental uh, is brought up for a vote in the House of Representatives, I believe it will pass. I think there's bipartisan support for it. But uh, he has to have the courage to defy some of the extreme members in the Republican caucus and bring it up for a vote. I I certainly hope he does. Well, let's stay in the reality lane for a minute then, Senator, uh, because we know what we've heard from Speaker Johnson, and we know that you want to see that money get to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. If we're in a world in which a discharge petition is a fantasy, and I think that's what you're suggesting, there, there is another approach in the House that might bring a separate bill with defense-only money, whether or not there's a special mechanism to bring it to the floor. If that was the best version you got in the Senate, would you vote for it? I'd be troubled by it because there's a provision in our bill for humanitarian assistance, which is absolutely life or death essential in Gaza and critical places around the world and to send just the military side of it and ignore the reality of the humanitarian nightmare taking place in Gaza is a serious, serious mistake. We need to put the whole measure before the House, let let them vote. I believe there'll be a strong bipartisan majority for them. 
Well, speaking of a bipartisan view on this issue, of course, on the other side of the aisle in your chamber, the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has been a vocal advocate for aiding Ukraine. And of course, he told the world yesterday he will no longer be the Republican leader in the Senate after the election in November. I'd like you to just listen to part of what Senator McConnell said on the floor yesterday, and I'll have you respond. I know the politics within my party at this particular moment in time. I have many faults. Misunderstanding politics is not one of them. That said, I believe more strongly than ever that America's global leadership is essential to preserving the shining city on a hill that Ronald Reagan discussed. Senator, he spoke about awareness of the politics in his party and being aware of those politics and who potentially could replace him as leader. Who would bring the greatest chance of bipartisan cooperation with Democrats? You know, there are three people who are mentioned, and they're currently in leadership on the Republican side, John Thune, John Cornyn, and John Barrasso. I've worked with all three of them. I can work with them in the future. So if they turn out to generate the leader of their party in the United States Senate, I think it'll be a positive thing. But it's up to the Republicans. They may choose one of those or someone else. Uh, the bottom line is we need to work on a bipartisan basis to solve the problems of this country. You talked earlier in one of your programs about the border crisis. It does exist. We had a bipartisan response put together, brought to the floor just a few weeks ago, asking the Republicans to join us in an effort to pass it, to make some progress. It was endorsed by the Border Patrol agents, endorsed by the Wall Street Journal, and they rejected it. They wouldn't move forward. We need someone who will accept a good bipartisan compromise that moves us forward as a nation on our border and on many other areas. The border seems to creep its way into just about every issue that we talk about, certainly every attempt at policy making, at lawmaking. Uh, Senator Durbin, I wonder what you can tell us about this effort uh, to not only have uh, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas impeached, but have a trial uh, to convict him in the Senate. The conventional wisdom is that it will die a quiet death in your chamber, but how? Well, there are various ways to do it. It is a political stunt by the House of Representatives and, and really tells us a story of why we have a problem. Instead of dealing with the budget, keeping the lights on for a, a full fiscal year, they went off and impeached the Secretary of Homeland Security. There was no basis for that. No high crime or misdemeanor was even alleged in this situation. They wasted their time on it, and it's a waste of time in the Senate. I hope we spend very little time with that. Let's roll up our sleeves on a bipartisan basis and start solving problems instead of political stunts. Well, as we talk about the border, obviously we saw President Biden and former President Trump on the border in Texas, which is a border state yesterday. And yet we've heard language from the likes of Speaker Mike Johnson just today that every state right now is a border state because of the way migrants are moving through the country, including to major Democratic stronghold cities like New York and also Chicago. Senator, what are you seeing in real time on the ground at home? It's a struggle. Uh, the governor of Texas is dumping off families uh, in the dark of night many times in remote areas of my state, and they're finding their way into Chicago under desperate circumstances. One little boy recently died after he arrived. I mean, it's a terrible humanitarian situation brought on unnecessarily by the governor of Texas. But it does reflect the fact that the border needs to be changed and the laws need to be changed on the border. President Biden has said that. He's working on a bipartisan basis on a bill. But unfortunately, Donald Trump, former President Trump, has, does, has said clearly he doesn't want to move forward in that. And he, says, he said very clearly, please blame me for stopping this bill, this bipartisan bill from moving forward. Well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to blame him for stopping at least progress that needs to be made at the border uh, immediately. Well, is Illinois a border state? And I'm not talking about Wisconsin, Senator. Well, I can tell you that, uh, you know, we are a nation of immigrants. We are a state of immigrants. And they've done a remarkable job in making this the nation it is today. My mother was an immigrant to this country. I'm very proud of that fact. But we cannot accept everyone who wants to come into the United States at this moment. We need an orderly process at the border. We need to accept those who are no threat to us and make us a stronger nation. Uh, unfortunately, the situation can't move forward unless we have something like this bipartisan bill that was agreed to with Senator Langford, 
Republican of Oklahoma, Senator Murphy of Democratic Connecticut, an independent senator uh, from Arizona. And she has been a critical element in this whole process. Mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned that you do cast blame on former President Donald Trump for disrupting that future uh, progress on that specific measure. On the subject of former President Trump, it was this time yesterday when we got news from the Supreme Court that they will hear his immunity question, where he claims immunity from prosecution here in Washington in Jack Smith's 2020 uh, election interference case. Do you view that as a political move? by this court, knowing it could potentially delay his trial so that it does not take place before Election Day? Well, it is an interesting coincidence that they have delayed this for two months, uh, and they make it almost impossible to resolve all of his indictments before the date of the upcoming election. But this issue has to be resolved, and he raised it. He believes that as president, he somehow has a uh, do-not-go-to-jail card forever. I don't believe that's true, and I hope the court doesn't find it that way. Well, Senator, of course, as chairman, you were in the room for the hearings uh, that confirmed the three justices that came in the Trump administration. Were you aware at the time? I know these were difficult hearings. I, I watched them all. Were you aware at the time that you were sowing the seeds for a decision like this? No, I didn't think this would happen. But, you know, these nominees for Supreme Court justices uh, make very passive and neutral statements. They don't want to be pinned mm -hmm. down on anything. The fact is, once they've taken the oath of office to serve for life, the real visions of their views of America start coming before the voters from one end to the other. In this situation, we learn a lot more about the justices after they're sworn in. Well, and of course, those are just the three justices that were appointed and confirmed during Trump's administration. There is another justice, though, that you have taken issue with, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, whose wife, Ginny Thomas, is actually involved in many of these 2020 uh, electoral questions. You have called for his recusal in a number of these cases as a result. He heard the arguments on the 14th Amendment question. We haven't gotten any real sign that he plans to recuse himself from the case they will hear in April as it relates to immunity. Is there anything, Senator? you can do to change that? No, of course not. Uh, impeachment is out of the question. It's not going to happen. But the fact of the matter is it's a conflict of interest for Clarence Thomas to sit on some of these cases after his wife was personally and directly involved in negotiating with the highest levels of the White House during this controversy. He should step aside for the good of the court and his own reputation. Senator, you've been a creature of the upper chamber for some time. I wonder with everything that we've been talking about, uh, the potential leadership battle for the Republican conference in the Senate, the possibility of Donald Trump being elected again, even if he isn't, the, the heavy hand that he's held over Capitol Hill. Do you fear the Senate will soon start looking and feeling like the House? I'm afraid that it might. There are some elements in the Senate even today that harken back to the approach of politics of Donald Trump. You did a story on a show just right before I came on where they did a survey and said that a large percentage of the population was afraid to vote for Donald Trump because he was dangerous. I've been around politics a number of years. I can never remember a major candidate for president of the United States being characterized as dangerous by voters across the United States. But that is the reality. When Donald Trump says either inject or drink a bottle of bleach to avoid COVID or invites NATO allies uh, to be attacked by Vladimir Putin, it is dangerous. And I think the American people are aware of that reality. I hope that doesn't infect the United States Senate. Senator, we have less than a minute left, but that same poll actually found a greater share of voters find President Biden too old. Is enough being done to counter that message? <laughs> I'm sure that Joe Biden would like to be younger tomorrow, but he doesn't have the power to do that. I would trust his judgment and his stamina over a dangerous candidate for president any day. Senator, we appreciate your spending time with us this evening. Dick Durbin of Illinois with us from Capitol Hill. We hope you get home this evening, Senator. Come back and see us again soon. Coming up, we'll be joined by Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis, the Republican from New York, weighing in on these same issues. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
that bill text is going to be posted this weekend. All of our members will have 72 hours to review it. That's our commitment. That's our rule. We're respecting it. And that's the only reason we need the process CR to allow us time to do that. If I did it the way, I don't know, Speaker Pelosi did, we just drop that bill and vote on it within hours, right? We're not going to do that. We want members to be able to have their review and their say and to see all of that. House Speaker Mike Johnson a bit earlier today, knowing now that the House has passed a continuing resolution uh, that would keep the government from beginning to shut down tomorrow. It's on its way to the Senate, as we just discussed with Dick Durbin. If you're just joining us, we are waiting for a Senate vote on this this evening, and it could happen rather soon uh, as we now bring in Congresswoman Nicole Maliotakis of New York for the Republican view on things in the House. Congresswoman, it's good to see you. Uh, looks like We've bought a couple of weeks here to get something done. Six bills by next Friday, and then the following Friday we'll do it all over again. Is that enough time after the difficulty we have seen in getting spending bills passed? Or are you gearing up for another CR? Well, look, I think whatever passes from here on uh, will need to be passed in a bipartisan way. It's how we averted uh, the debt default. It's how we averted the shutdowns, how we passed the uh, Federal, Federal Aviation Act, the, uh, the, the NDAA for security, and also the extension of the child tax cut and the different provisions. That's how we're going to get anything done out of the House. You're going to see the far right and far left probably vote against a lot of things, as they have been, and you'll see everyone else in the, in the middle, roughly 300 members, vote in support of common sense bipartisanship. I think the biggest problem that we have is there are these members who believe that it's got to be all or nothing, and that's just not the way that you know business works, government works, life works. You have to give a little to get a little. And uh, what we're seeing is now this compromise that is emerging from the Senate and the House. And we'll see. I, I think more, more members are upset, though, about not having as much input into this process. It's kind of come down to the leaders negotiating these individual bills. And then we'll have an opportunity to review it. Yes, we'll have the opportunity to read it, which I think is incredibly important to know what is in a bill before we vote for it. But I do feel that a lot of members, including myself, do feel that we've been sort of shut out of this process uh, in terms of seeing what we would like to see in these various appropriation bills that we'll be taking up next week. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if members like yourself are a bit dissatisfied, perhaps, with the transparency being provided by leadership and Speaker Mike Johnson, and as you mentioned, there are a number of conservatives who are dissatisfied with this another short-term CR that Mike Johnson initially said he did not want to do. Is his speakership in real danger, especially if he's going to be passing bipartisan bills that don't necessarily sit well with, say, the House Freedom Caucus? Well, look, I, I don't think it should be. I think the reality is we're going to have this issue regardless of who the speaker is. There will be a group of people who will never be satisfied uh, because we have to negotiate with the Senate. And what they need to recognize is that Republicans control just the House, and we control the House by just two votes. And so we need, if we're only one-third of the government, to actually work as best as we can with the Senate and the White House. We should fight for our priorities. We should continue to fight for serious provisions to get this border secured. Uh, we should fight for fiscal sanity. We should fight for the extension of our uh, you know, tax credits that were very important under the Trump administration that stimulated the economy, that brought us to 50-year low unemployment, uh, lifted wages, and help uh, businesses invest. We should fight for all those priorities, uh, and we need to, right? And we're doing that on behalf of the American people. But at some point, you have to recognize we're not going to get everything that we want. We have to mm -hmm. take some of the things that the Senate's going to want, which we may not like, and we're going to have to give up some. But we should continue to fight as much as we can and as hard as we can to try to get real results for the American people. And like I said, you're going to see the far right and far left vote against anything that comes to the floor. Uh, and that's why it's going to rest on the 300 of us in the middle that hopefully will be able to come to an agreement here and support what the final product is. Well, we talked about the border issue with your colleague from South Carolina, Congressman Ralph Norman. He joined us right around this time yesterday talking about the border and the difficulty the House has had to address this. Here's what he said. We're continually stressing the might that under any uh, agreement ought to be firm metrics to stop the border hemorrhaging that's, that's occurring. And we can't keep going with letting everybody from over 160 countries come into America. 
are you sending that same message uh, to the speaker as Congressman Norman is, or do you regret not having this Senate compromise come to the floor in the House? Well, the Senate compromise does not do the job. What it does is it has an automatic shutdown if you average 5,000 individuals over a week, but then it's up to the president a discretion to how long that border is closed. So if the yeah. president has authorities right now that he's not using to secure the border, what makes us think that he would use any additional discretion? The difference between the Senate bill and the House bill that we passed in May that Schumer won't allow for a vote is that mm -hmm. our bill actually requires the president to do all these things. Reinstate Remain in Mexico yeah. and catch and release. Um, it it sure. makes them address the asylum issue, parole. Uh, though we, we cannot give... Uh, uh, the president more discretion. He already has discretion. Okay. In fact, you just said it, though, that the middle's got to right decide now. this. Right, Congresswoman? I mean, Jim Langford mm -hmm. is a serious conservative. I think you would agree. I, I suspect that you appreciate the professionalism of Chris Murphy, not to mention uh, Kirsten Cinema, coming at this all from different angles. How's it going to get better than this? This is what so many lawmakers have been asking for, isn't it? Well, I guess what, what the, the House believes is if the Senate truly wants funding, uh, as their number one priority is funding for Ukraine and Taiwan and Israel, uh, we can match that with H.R. 2, our Border Security Act, which is our number one priority. Uh, we can give a little on H.R. 2, but certainly we want something passed that's actually going to do the job. For me to pass something that's just going to simply mm -hmm. give the president more discretion that he's not going to use doesn't really work. Because right now he has executive authorities under uh, Title 18, uh, 1182 and uh, 1225 that he can use today. That's what President Trump used to secure the border. Unfortunately, the current president used it to dismantle the border. And that is what we're seeing uh, taking place right now. Well, your Republican colleague in the House has, uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, is leading an effort to have a slim down uh, package, would be defense only, get out some of the humanitarian aid, have a border component in it. Is that something, Congressman, you could, could get behind? Would you sign on to a discharge petition to get that on the floor if he were to put it forward? Well, I'm actually reviewing that proposal now. Uh, it seems to be a better plan than what the Senate has put forward. Um, I, I want to make sure that it actually does the job and secures the border. I think uh, it, it is really what the Republicans in the conference have been talking about. They want to focus on military aid, not humanitarian aid. Uh, and so if we can focus on the military foreign aid and couple it with real border security solutions that are actually going to stem the flow, then I think it will work. So I'm reviewing that right now, and I've been speaking with Brian Fitzpatrick about it. Um, so I, I, what's, what's happening right now is this obviously unsustainable. And I think there's other issues as well that should be addressed, right? We, we yeah. do want to have more visas so people can come legally to, to satisfy uh, employers' needs, have family-sponsored mm -hmm. visas as well. I think those are areas adding more judges to deal with the backlog. But none of it matters if we don't actually stem the flow right now. We should never be encouraging sure. people to pay thousands of dollars to be smuggled over uh, our southern border at the hands of the drug cartels. Nobody benefits from that. Absolutely no one. So we, we, we can do it in a better way, uh, but we have to stem the flow. Well, and Congresswoman, finally, as I know that the immigration border issue is very close to you in New York, given what New York City uh, is experiencing, just a final question on New York now that the redistricting map has been finalized. How do you feel about it? Well, my district stays the same, so I'm happy about that. Um, I was disappointed when the uh, Democrats sued to try to get the independently drawn map uh, removed, but it seemed that the process overall worked out and everyone seems to be satisfied knowing that at least they have a competitive seat. I mean, that's all we've asked for. We just wanted to have a fair race. We believe we can win on merit, on debate, on policy, uh, as we did in 2022. And so I think overall, the we survived this process once again, but it should have been left alone after the court appointed a special master. You couldn't get any more independent than that. 
and, and the map shouldn't have remained. I think the bigger issue in New York is that Democrats have caused so much destruction that they're afraid of their reelection chances. I mean, that's the reality. All you're seeing right now, from the president's open border policies to the state's bail law to the sanctuary policies of New York City Council uh, that, that have released individuals back onto our street instead of deporting them if they commit crimes, uh, people are very frustrated right now with the Democratic Party, and rightfully so. Okay. And so I think that we'll see see um, New York Republicans that won in 2022 prevail again this year, and we will be, again, the key to the House keeping the Republican majority. All right. Republican Congresswoman of New York, Nicole Maliotakis, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Appreciate your time. Now, coming up over in the Senate, the race to replace Mitch McConnell as head of the Senate GOP has begun. We'll discuss his potential successors with our political panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Leader McConnell's had a great, long career here in the United States Senate, the longest serving leader, as you mentioned, and he's got a lot to point to. If you think about his success during the Trump administration, seating three Supreme Court justices, his impact on the federal judiciary will be longstanding and very positive for the nation. And he's come to the decision that uh, the time has come to change. That was Republican Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee, a member of McConnell's conference, on with us yesterday after the news that McConnell will be stepping down as the GOP's leader in the Senate after the election in November. Joining us now is our political panel, Emily Lampkin, founder of the Women Leader Series, and Matt Bennett, Third Way co-founder. Great to have you both on the program this evening. So, Emily, it's been a little over 24 hours since McConnell made this announcement, and already you have hats officially thrown in the ring, including from Senator John Cornyn, who asks his Republican colleagues to give him the opportunity to succeed Leader McConnell. That's just one of the Johns that we think are likely to be in the mix here, including Thune and Barrasso as well. Who do you think ultimately gets the job? Who's the strongest candidate here? I always love people trying to decide this. There's eight months to go. <laughs> I will tell you, here's two things that stuck with me immediately. Number one, wasn't it refreshing to hear from a politician that it was time for a new generation? Oh. And wasn't it great that you had Nicole Maliotakis on, who's part of that new generation? So there's good news there. We have a lot of leaders in the Senate who could do this job. And I think you've heard this on both sides of the aisle just over the last 24 hours there's a great number of options, and they've got time to think through it. And I like some of the early ideas to actually spend some time, too, maybe putting together what is our agenda, what are we looking for, and who would be the best leader for that agenda. I think the question a lot of people are, are asking, though, is this going to be, when we talk about the three Johns, someone from the establishment wing of the Republican Party or somebody who's going to bring a very different flavor? Are we looking at Josh Hawley's and Tom Cotton's that would, that would change the, the contours, the complexion of the upper chamber that was so important to Mitch McConnell? Maybe they'll be a hybrid. You think? Yeah, I think there's lots of people in the Senate who can both recognize and respect who we would consider both sides of this group yeah. that you're suggesting. Uh -huh. Well, there's been reporting today that Donald Trump is pushing Steve Daines yeah, to enter this right. race. That could be another name uh, in the mix here. Mm -hmm. But Emily was just speaking, Matt, to the idea of a new generation of leadership. Would any of the Johns be a new generation Realistically, you know, you're talking about a Republican conference when you have three guys named John all running for the same job that the diversity of that conference is not so overwhelming that and Steve Daines doesn't bring much of that either. I think the thing to watch is the, the question you just asked, which is, does Trump control every aspect of this party? He already weighed in and said, none of the Johns are acceptable to me. I want this other guy. And so far, at least the Republicans in Congress on both sides have bent the knee to Trump in every possible way, I think that'll probably continue. I want to get back to something that Emily mentioned. Uh, this brings forth the age issue in a pretty real way. An 82-year-old decided that he, he had had enough. Uh, and I forget the language that he used, but I think he suggested he had fewer accomplishments ahead of him than behind him. Joe Biden's going to stand up in front of a joint session next week to deliver the State of the Union. With massive questions about his age, our new Bloomberg News poll shows vast majorities of voters think he's not really old, but too old to do the job. 
Did that just get more difficult because of what Mitch McConnell did? I don't think so. Remember, both of them are old. Donald Trump is three years younger than Joe Biden. Three years matters when you're in high school, which they were in the same time. It doesn't matter so much at this age. And so I think what you saw Biden do when he went on uh, Jimmy Kimmel's show the other night mm -hmm. was basically make this a choice between two older guys. The other thing to consider is the last State of the Union went pretty well for Biden and pretty badly for the Republicans. They walked right into a, a bunch of traps that he set. He, he performed extremely well. If he does that again, I think that's going to really help him set this issue aside or at least neutralize it somewhat. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have more on the president and Bloomberg's polling about him and, and former President Donald Trump uh, coming up in just a few minutes here. But just on Congress, Emily, as we think about Mitch McConnell now having left, the raft of retirement announcements we have seen from chairs of committees in the House – who is going to be left over? What is the identity on Capitol Hill going to look like when you have some of its most se senior members, uh, not even just in age? Mike Gallagher, the chair of the China Committee, is 39 years old, yeah. deciding they've had enough of this place that's looking pretty dysfunctional right now. Uh, as I said, there's a new generation, pretty exciting. I think we have plenty of leaders. There are plenty of members. There's plenty of leaders, plenty of people who can take this role. We complained for years that we had committee chairs who stayed too long. And then we get committee chairs who don't stay too long, and we complain <laughs> about that. And I, I will say even beyond that, when I look at who we have running out there for this country, it is extraordinary the amount of Americans who will say, I want to do this job, and mm -hmm. I can be reasonable, and I can represent my constituents. Mm -hmm. So I have no fear that we're not going to have committee chairs who can't do their jobs. Will the next leader be minority leader or majority leader? I, we've got a little bit of time, Joe. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to push it when Emily is with us. Coming up, former <laughs> President Trump maintaining his lead over President Biden in seven key swing states, the poll I just mentioned. We'll distill the numbers coming up with our panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Mr. Trump, instead of playing politics with this issue, instead of telling members of Congress to block this legislation, join me, or I'll join you, in telling the Congress to pass this bipartisan border security bill. We can do it together. You know and I know it's the toughest, most efficient, most effective border security bill this country has ever seen. President Biden speaking just a short time ago along the Texas-Mexico border. They were both there today. Donald Trump, too. The border, of course, fast rising as an issue for swing state voters in our newest poll, Bloomberg News and Morning Consult. Let's reassemble our panel for their take on it. Emily Lampkin is back with us, founder of the Women Leaders Series, alongside Matt Bennett, co-founder of Third Way. It's great to see you both here again. Emily, I know you're going to tell me that it's early and that we need more time, and we probably do. But when you look at the map here, we've been doing this for a few months. Donald Trump beating Joe Biden in all seven of the swing states that we expect will decide the next presidential election. This is feeling somewhat inevitable to you, is it not? I, I, no, I don't think there's any inevitability. I like that we have three strong um, Senate races within those states, too. Mm -hmm. That should be a positive sign. And I think that President Biden, again, keeps giving us gifts. If you want to talk about inevitable, yeah. it is inevitable that we've got to address the border. And him drawing this out longer and longer and longer only makes those plus numbers go up and up and up in states all over the country. Well, we have seen, as we're doing this poll every month, the border ticking up in terms of being a top issue for voters in these states. And Matt, he was there today saying the Senate needs to do something. He didn't announce any other plans for executive action or policy changes he is going to make. Why go? Well, First of all, because he has signed on to a very good bill that was written by a very conservative senator, along with Chris Murphy, the Democrat. It's an excellent bipartisan bill. It's tough. It's smart. And it would but handle it died, the big problem. So why not move to plan, plan B? Well, th there is no plan B because the House has stopped everything. I do think he will announce some executive actions, but there's not that much he can do. The president is hamstrung when the Congress just fails to do its job utterly, and that's what the Republicans in the House have done. And they've done it because they were told to tank this very good deal by Donald Trump, and that's why the president was calling out Trump for that today. 
Well, he's going to deliver a pretty important speech, as we were just referring to uh, next week. Will he make no news on the border, no executive approach to do something different, even if he's waiting for a legislative answer? Oh, I'm certain that he will, that he will have some executive uh, actions that he can roll out either before the speech, they'll preview them in all likelihood, and then he'll announce them during the speech. That's generally what you do. Yeah. Um, and so I'm certain this trip was to kind of tee that up. Mm -hmm. But again, they're not going to sound sweeping because he just doesn't have the power to do that without Congress acting. So, of course, Biden was part of this poll, but Trump was as well, Emily. And while we already touched on the age part, eight in 10 voters in these states think Biden is too old, less think Trump is too old, more think Trump is dangerous. Why isn't that mattering more? I think every voter, here's what we're finding out during these primary votes. Mm -hmm. We are getting more and more data about what voters are thinking live this year. And I would assume that at the end of the day, most voters are looking for what's the best economic situation for my family and how do I keep them safe? Mm -hmm. And I think when it comes to who's going to create the best environment for me to have take-home pay and for me to make decisions about my family and who's going to make sure that criminals out of sanctuary cities aren't creeping into other neighborhoods and creating crime for families um, all across the country that they think Trump's a better option than Biden. Even if he could end up a convicted criminal himself. I think that they've made it clear that a lot of Americans think that that's not the threshold by which they're making decisions. When mm -hmm. you're looking at your pocketbook and your family, mm -hmm. that's your most important asset. Did that Supreme Court ruling yesterday just make a Donald Trump win more likely if there's going to be no trial? Well, it certainly helped Trump. And I think had he been convicted of the crimes that he's accused of in, in the Washington case, yeah. uh, he couldn't possibly win. His support goes down by 20 points. So it helped him. All right, Matt Bennett and Emily Lampkin, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. And of course, for more coverage, check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Tomorrow will be Friday, we're told. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you then. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.